Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Grading Wall Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and we are at episode number 265 today. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we are going to talk to a highly esteemed professor of economics at Boston College, and he is the author of over 15 books and hundreds and hundreds of professional articles. I think you'll find the interview to be very interesting as we talk about the clash of generations and what all those demographic and economic issues mean to all of us as real estate investors, or actually, you know, I I should be corrected again, income property investors, because we don't necessarily like real estate. We like income property. There is a difference. And if you want to know what that difference is and you're a new listener, Listen to some of the prior episodes and you can find out all about it. But I hope you enjoyed the uh, last show on financing. And we have got so many shows coming up for you. I know I have been saying that and we have been a little bit slower than I'd like at publishing them. We'd like to get two or three episodes out to you every week. But gosh darn it, we are just so busy right now. It is amazing how the market is and how people want to just grab up income properties like they are going out of style, which reminds me, I want to do that too. So if you are interested in partnering with me or selling me an interest in a property that you already own, keep in mind, we would be interested in doing that. And I've explained kind of the way I work with my partnerships with our clients on the show before, but you know, let me know if you're interested. Inquire through the website. Just let one of our investment counselors know through the jasonhartman.com website and they will put you in touch with me. They can explain the way that works. But any property that you might be interested in through our network, I would be interested in potentially almost 100% partnering on that property with you because I am looking to expand my ownership footprint myself And also, when speaking about different than the usual, just buying properties for your own account, private lending and hard money lending. Boy, we have a lot of you doing that. One of the challenges we found lately is that it's hard to place loans, but get in the queue, get in line. And when we have properties come up for you that make sense, you can fund those deals for our local market specialists. And it's a real different relationship than typical traditional hard money lending. I know many of you have called me about that over the prior months and actually the prior year. And we are interested in doing hard money or private lending within our network because we have a very unique, very special arrangement when it comes to the dynamics that take place within our network in properties that we have all over the country. And you can earn well over 12% as a note rate plus fees. So depending on how fast the loan pays off, whether it be as short as 28 days, where I've had one of mine pay off that quickly, my return on investment there was over 20% annually, or it may be as long as six months or so, and your return on investment there would be just over probably about 12 and a half, 12 and three quarters percent all in with your fees. So some great opportunities there. But when you speak of great opportunities, I want to also mention something to you before we go to today's guest, and I'll keep this really short. But I was doing hot yoga last night. Now, how many of you have tried hot yoga before or yoga in general? This doesn't especially apply to hot yoga, but I really like hot yoga. Now, that may come as an odd surprise to you because I live in Arizona and the temperature in the the room, the yoga studio 
in summertime is sometimes actually a degree or two or three <laughs> cooler than the temperature outside. I know, I, I just have to laugh when I say that because it's so ironic. But it is much more humid inside that room. And if you haven't tried hot yoga, I would highly recommend it. I think it is like the fountain of youth. It's pretty amazing how you, how you feel. The, those endorphins just flowing through your bloodstream when you come out of that class are pretty, pretty awesome. Anyway, what I was thinking about is I was doing one of those yoga poses last night, and I was looking at the dot on my yoga map as I was on one foot, kind of in a flying position, in one of the warrior poses. And I was looking at the dot to try and keep my balance. And in yoga, they call this a dristi. This is called a dristi. Okay, and the dristi is the place on which you focus your eyes that helps you keep your balance. Why am I mentioning this now? Well, Here's why. We're moving into a somewhat crazy market where people in the income property business and the real estate business are out there starting to huck all kinds of strange and creative deals. And what does that mean? Well, when we get into this kind of market, every scam artist and their brother comes out of the woodwork. How do I know this? Because I've been through it. I've been through several cycles now with my many years in the business as an investor and as a real estate salesperson, as a real estate agent, owning a few different real estate companies, seeing all the people that come to work for me, all the people that come and present different deals, all the people that call us all the time that want to present deals to you, our clients or our listeners, our audience through my company. And when the market gets like this, when it gets frothy, when it gets crazy, and it is getting like that nowadays, be careful. Focus. Keep your eyes focused on your goals. Keep your eyes focused on rational, prudent investing, on the tried and true rules that apply to income property investing that we have talked about on the last 264 episodes of the Creating Wealth Show, and even on my other shows as well. So keep focused. That is your dristy. That is what you need to do, is you need to stay focused on what is prudent, what makes sense, and that is all I will really say about it. But the thought just went through my mind in that 104 degree, 90% humidity room last night as I was trying to keep my balance. I thought nowadays, more than, more than ever, well, not more than ever, but more than ever in the past maybe five or six years until back in 2005, 2006 when it was crazy then and even before, and back in various points in, in the early 2000s and in the 90s and back in the 80s. And I don't even want to talk back further than that because then I start to show my age. But every time you get a crazy market where properties are flying off the shelves, all of the scammy people come out of the woodwork. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Not to say that they're not there in the more mellow markets like we had even just two or three years ago. They're there in those markets too, but I think more so in this kind of market. So focus, keep your eyes focused on your dristy, on your goals. Make sure you don't fall over. You don't get sucked in by some scam. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, as the saying goes. And I just want to mention that to you. Look forward to a couple events we've got coming up. Again, we're still trying to confirm dates on those. But we've got our Meet the Masters of Income Property Investing event. This one is going to be rather different than the ones you've come to in the past. We do that twice a year. That's coming up later this year. And also our Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Boot Camp and property tour in Atlanta, Georgia. So we will announce those as soon as we firm them up with the venues, and they are coming very, very soon. So let's go to our guest today, and let's talk about demographics and economics, and we'll be back with that in just a moment. Jason provides an extremely unique service, Deal Evaluator. Are you interested in a property outside of our network? Need a second opinion? No problem. Let our experts evaluate the deal. Find out more about it at jasonhartman.com. 
My pleasure to welcome Lawrence Kotlikoff to the show. He is a professor of economics at Boston University and the author of several books, including The Clash of the Generations, Saving Ourselves, Our Kids, Our Economy. Larry, welcome. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Well, we are in quite a peril. I have many times referred to it as the $60 trillion time bomb. That's trillion with a T, of course. But you are calling it a much bigger time bomb than that. And you do propose some solutions, and we're looking forward to hearing them. First of all, the background. What is the problem? Just outline that for the listeners, if you would. Okay. Well, the economy, like a business, has a balance sheet. And the government has assets, which are taxes that are coming due through time. They have a certain present value. And there's also liabilities. So there's the assets, the taxes. The liabilities are the official debt plus the present value of all the future expenditures that are scheduled to occur for uh, Social Security benefits, for Medicare, for Medicaid, for defense expenditure. All these things also have a present value. And uh, if you look at the combination of the official debt plus the present value of these spending liabilities, that's the unofficial debt, the two things together exceed the assets, which is the present value of the taxes, by $211 trillion. So that's what we economists call our fiscal gap. And these numbers that are underlying this calculation are coming from the Congressional Budget Office. So they're not numbers that I cooked up or some economists. They're coming right out of the government. All you have to do is kind of do some arithmetic with the government's projections, and you see a colossal fiscal imbalance, a colossal problem, much bigger than anything anybody has uh, been talking about. The uh, $60 trillion figure you're talking about is, I think, based on just looking out 75 years, but there's no reason to stop the projection 75 years from now because the uh, kids today are going to be around 75 years from now. So we have to think about the benefits we're going to have to pay to them. In addition, the way the accounting works is the cash flows aren't really well defined. Uh, We use particular words to describe government receipts and payments. Some of them we call taxes and some of them we call borrowing on the receipt side. On the payment side, some of them we call repayment of principal plus interest and some we call transfer payments. And what choice of words we use here doesn't change the fundamental economics, but it does change the cash flows that are being projected over any finite horizon over 75 years, for example. And so that's really arbitrary. The only thing that's really not arbitrary is what we call the infinite horizon present value and uh, fiscal gap. And that's $211 trillion. And that's enormous. And to get some idea about how big that is, we would have to raise every single federal tax immediately and permanently by 64% in order to come up with $211 trillion in present value. Or we could cut all non-interest spending by the government uh, by 40%. So if you go to your mom's Social Security benefit, Jason, I don't know if she's collecting, but let's say she is, has to be cut 40%. Her Medicare benefits have to be cut 40%. She's collecting Medicaid. They have to be cut 40%. The defense spending has to be cut 40%. That's the magnitude of the problem that we're facing. The country is broke. It's totally broke. It's in worse shape than Greece. So, Larry, yes, of course, when you look at the balance sheet, it's, it's, we are in uh, much more dire straits than, than Greece, for example, and Greece is in a terrible mess. However, you know, we do have the reserve currency, at least for the moment, <laughs> and while the world still appears to have some faith in us. But, you know, we also have so many other advantages in terms of military. We can sort of throw our weight around a bit and manipulate situations with it and so forth. It can't really, in all fairness, be compared to Greece in, in the same way, just from a, a balance sheet perspective, can it? Yeah, absolutely. It can be compared because uh, we have taken upon ourselves to be the policemen of the entire globe. So we An have expensive proposition, to say the least. Expensive proposition. Greece doesn't have to deal with that. Greece has had some pension reforms. They've got a health care system that's under control. They decide how much to pay for the doctors. They hire the doctors directly. They hire the they build the hospitals or not build the hospitals. They decide what drugs the public are going to get. So their uh, control over their expenditures going forward is much better than ours. So we're actually, and the fact that we can print money is not really much of a blessing here because 
what happens if you print, uh, you know, we've got a $211 trillion problem. Uh, our basic money supply called the M1 money supply is uh, about $2 trillion or so, maybe $2.5 trillion. If we were to uh, print $20 trillion, what would we end up with, Jason? We'd end up with hyperinflation. Yeah, it, so, which I think we're already going to end up with yes, some degree of hyper hyperinflation. Unfortunately, has no academic definition, but whatever you perceive to be hyperinflation, I think it's going to be pretty severe. Yeah, absolutely. The government since 2007 has quadrupled the monetary base. In other words, it's that's the basic amount of money that it uh, has printed has been quadrupled uh, since 2007. Since two thousand, so let's examine that. So, since it could really be argued, and I guess maybe the reason, and I'd love to have you address this, that we haven't seen quadruple inflation since two thousand and seven because we've created so much more money, is because that money hasn't hit the streets yet. It, it's it's sort of in the hands of the banks, and and right. it hasn't trickled down to Main Street. It's still on Wall Street. Is is that the reason that the inflation well, hasn't happened? Because the, the true academic definition of inflation, of course, is just money printing. The result of money printing is we see is an increase in prices that most people call inflation. But why haven't we seen the inflation yet? Well, the Federal Reserve has been paying the banks to hold what are called excess reserves. So they've injected this money into the economy. It's been deposited in the banks. And then the Fed is, in effect, bribing the banks not to lend it out. And so on the one hand, we're trying to stimulate the economy. On the other hand, the Fed is doing everything it can to keep this uh, money from hitting the streets, as you said, because once it does, it could lead to inflation taking off. And then once prices start to rise, people start to uh, treat money as uh, a hot potato. And then the money becomes, in effect, faster. It just the same money starts circulating more rapidly the through the economy. The velocity increases, yeah. The velocity increases, and then we can have endogenous inflation. Inflation just takes off on its own. So we have the basis uh, in place now for a quadrupling of the price level. And... That's scary enough, let alone trying to print our way out of a $211 trillion problem. It keeps getting bigger. You know, the the fiscal gap grew by $6 trillion between last year and this year because, you know, while the members of Congress are arguing over, uh, you know, $2 trillion, saving that over 10 years, in one year alone, the fiscal gap rose by $6 trillion because all the baby boomers are one year closer to getting these very significant benefits. Uh, my generation, when we're, when we're fully retired, we're going to be getting $40,000 per person in today's dollars, three quarters of per capita GDP. Actually, sorry, it's going to be about 85% of per capita GDP every year for our full retirements. So that's going to be an enormous bill, about $3 trillion in total in today's dollars every year the boomers are in their retirement. And who's going to pay for this? Well, it's going to be people in your generation or not. Uh, the whole thing could blow up into the boomer's face. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about in this book, The Clash of Generations, Scott Burns and I, in our new book. Two things I'd, I'd like you to address that you just mentioned, fascinating things. Number one, you're saying that the, the Fed is actually bribing the banks not to lend? I mean, if you listen to Bernanke and and Geithner and Obama, it's all about let's get money lent into the hands of small businesses and into the housing market to stimulate it. I mean, that's just window dressing, isn't it? And how, how are they how are they bribing them not to lend the money? Because they're certainly still pretty tight with lending. I mean, better well, than they were at the depths of the financial crisis three years ago, but, but still federal, it's very tight. Yeah. The way it works is the Federal Reserve is paying interest on these excess reserves. They could make that interest uh, rather than 25 basis points, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot in this environment. They could make it zero basis points or negative basis points. They could tax banks for holding excess reserves. They could get the banks to make loans. No question about it. And uh, they're worried about inflation. They're worried about – see, part of what's going on here is a under-the-cover method of – restoring the bank's balance sheet. So giving the banks free money, if you like. You uh, let them uh, borrow money at, uh, at low rates, and then they, uh, well, the, the banks basically are able to get a return on, at this 25 basis points, which is more than they can get on the market. 
Yeah. Well, they, so, in other words, yeah. the banks, all they're doing is buying treasury bills with the money, right? Because, yeah. you know, there's, that's a basically a no risk solution for them. And they're arbitraging the rate at which they borrow and the rate at which they invest, right? Well, they're either borrowing, holding treasury bills or just they're holding excess reserves and getting the 25 basis points uh, directly from the Federal Reserve as interest. Reserves. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, <laughs> what, an, what an unbelievable, frankly, scam that's going on, isn't it? It's, it's really a scam, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, the way, the way it works, just to be clear, is that the Fed prints some money. It lends it out at very low interest rates to the banks. And then the banks deposit it right back with the Fed and get a higher interest rate. So that's where the banks can be, you know, if they borrow at a low rate and they earn a higher rate at no risk, they can be made over time more solvent without the public understanding what's really going on. One of the things that Bernanke said on his first 60 Minutes interview, which, you know, is such a historic thing because a sitting Federal Reserve chair has never been interviewed uh, on 60 Minutes, or I, I don't think has done media interviews like that at all. And one of the things he said is he said that when he was asked about, well, aren't you worried about inflation with all of this, this stimulus? Back then we were QE1 or, <laughs> and, right. and now we're way, way into it. And, and he said, well, you know, we, we have tools that when, when inflation starts to rear its head, we will we'll rein it in with our tools. And, 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 and that is, in my opinion, such a complete lie, because you think you can just close Pandora's box and, and you know, with a couple strokes of a pen or a mouse, and, and that's simply not true. And I think one of the reasons it's, it's so untrue is, is what you said earlier. When money becomes progressively more and more value-less, it's as it's debased by inflation, you get this sort of hot potato syndrome. That was a great metaphor you just used, the hot potato syndrome. And yeah. when you look at inflationary examples throughout history, whether it be Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe or Hungary or where Argentina, wherever, people treat money like a hot potato. They get it in their hands and they can't wait to spend it because they want to trade it for goods and services before it goes down in value more. So the velocity increases and the rate of inflation, it just grows exponentially, doesn't it? So you said, you gave the example, 2007, the monetary base has increased by X amount, what, four times or something, right? right. And, and, and so that would say that the rate of inflation will be 4X. But really, when you throw into that the velocity, the hot potato problem, it, it becomes much good. worse, doesn't it? Absolutely. It could go up much more rapidly than four times if... Uh prices start to rise, people will naturally try and economize on money and it will become a, a hot potato. I, so, I, I mean, do even the laymen in the economy that really don't get it, the uninformed, they, they even understand that you should treat money like a hot potato when it's going down in value, right? Spend it now. You know, in the Weimar Republic, there are stories of people, as soon as they would get paid, they would rush out to spend their pay because right. they knew that if they waited even till later in the afternoon, it would go down in value. Absolutely. People are pay being paid with wheelbarrows full of money at uh, lunchtime and going and spending it immediately in that episode. So when Ben uh, Bernanke says that he's going to has complete control of these events, uh, every central banker has uh, made these kinds of statements before things got out of control. Now, the thing that he doesn't have control over is the fiscal policy. And the fiscal policy is going to put enormous pressure on the monetary authorities, just like we're seeing in Greece right now. Why is, why is Greece talking about getting uh, moving away from the euro? It's in order to have their own printing press and in order to try and use inflation as a way, as a hidden way of taxing people and uh, increasing expenditures without somehow this becoming apparent to the public. But it will culminate in inflation, if not hyperinflation in Greece. So going off the euro is fundamentally not an answer for Greece. It's just it's just a way to kick the can down the road. Exactly. It's yeah. more of that. And Bernanke is not going to be in a situation to somehow avoid the pressure of $211 trillion uh, where the government can't come up with $211 trillion in present value. I'm not saying it's all due today, but increasingly over time, whether it's Bernanke or, who is, who, or whoever is in the position of the chairman of the Fed, they're going to come under enormous pressure to ease monetary policy to print more money. And the way this is going to work is that over time, we're going to start running larger and larger official deficits so the public will finally see what I see just by doing the present value bookkeeping, 
you'll see it showing up in the official debt numbers, how bad the situation is. At some point, there will be a run on U.S. Uh, bonds in the sense that people will start, start dumping U.S. treasuries. Interest rates will spike. And then the Fed will be called upon to lower interest rates. And how do they do that? They print money and buy up the bonds. So the pressure to keep interest rates is really the pressure to print money, keep the interest rates from, from soaring. But if you get into one of these inflationary uh, spirals, the more money you print uh, doesn't lead to lower interest rates. It leads to higher interest rates because the inflation gets embedded in the interest rates and because people aren't going to lend money to the government if they expect their money to get paid back in, in watered-down dollars. They expect prices to rise. What do you think the real inflation rate is right now? I mean, the official statistics ever since, certainly I think the, the latter part of the Jimmy Carter era, have woefully underestimated inflation. If you ask me, it's 9 to 10% presently. Your thoughts? Well, they keep, they're changing the uh, basket of goods and services which are being uh, valued. So as things become more expensive, we start switching towards less expensive products and, and the CPI is being adjusted, taking into account the, the change in the, uh, in the bundle. So, and there's been some other adjustments in the CPI. I don't know. You know, I have to look at ice cream cones. Uh, that's my measure of inflation. And, <laughs> and they've been going up like crazy. Uh -huh. uh, and I think on an ice cream cone basis, price level has tripled or quadrupled actually, but it may be 10 years or 15 years. But I think that this, the BLS is doing a, a decent job at this. It's not a perfect science. And I don't think it's that we're dramatically understating inflation. I think that, that the economy is in a very bad shape and there's not a lot of pressure on prices. But again, if the banks start lending out $1.6 trillion, and again, if inflation, if, uh, if interest rates start moving up, they're going to have a big incentive to do that. The Fed could try and pay even more interest to bribe them to keep the money from getting into circulation, but that becomes kind of, uh, again, another kind of Ponzi scheme situation where you have to kind of print money to uh, try and uh, stay ahead of the uh, ball game here. If you print money to keep people from uh, lending out the money and that leads to interest rates to go even higher, then you're going to have to print even more money and it becomes something, something that lo you lose control of. And many, many countries have gotten into this boat. 20 countries in the last century ran hyperinflations. And it wasn't because they had central bankers who didn't think they could get control things. They all had central bankers who thought they were in charge of prices and they could, they could stabilize prices, but they weren't able to. Yeah, just one thing I wanted to say to you know listeners uh, who, who may be a little new to this stuff. You talked about how central bankers like Bernanke at the Federal Reserve are only in control of one side of the equation, and that's the monetary policy, not the fiscal policy. So government controls fiscal policy, and that's taxing and spending. Monetary right. policy, creation of fake money or fiat money, is controlled by central banks like the Federal Reserve. Let me just say that's true, except that when... The, when the fiscal side doesn't have enough tax revenue to cover its spending, then they go to the monetary authorities and right. try and have them print money to to pay for the things they want to buy. And so, so monetary policy is very much an element of fiscal policy. Sure, sure. They they most definitely interconnect for sure, but they're just not under direct control of each. Talk about the time frames, if you would, for a moment, because I thought the time frames were actually much shorter. On this call, you you cheered me up just a tad, maybe because I really have always kind of called it the sixty trillion dollar time bomb. I've heard people say it's a hundred and ten trillion. You say it's two hundred and eleven trillion, and of course that always depends on the time horizon because the time and the amount of the amount that we're at which we're underwater, they interplay with each other. And so the 60 trillion part, I, I was always thinking that that was about 15 to 20 years out. By the time we're at 2025, 2030, we're underwater about $60 trillion with the entitlement expectations. Is that true, or is, and is the 211 no, that's not, that's to $75 trillion? Only, or, yeah, tell me. The only number worth thinking about is the $211 trillion. All the other numbers are made up by actuaries or accountants who don't really understand the economics. None of the numbers actually have any grounding whatsoever in economics. First of all, there's this labeling problem, which is how you label receipts and payments will affect how you, re how you project the cash flows to be 
over the next 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. It's only this infinite horizon present value calculation that is label free. So we have a problem in economics uh, where certain certain measurements are not well defined, just like in physics, time and distance isn't well defined. In economics, the deficit, current taxes, current transfer payments, they're also not well defined because, you know, your Social Security contributions this year, Jason, I could call those a, a loan from you to the government. In other words, the government could be, uh, we could view that as borrowing by the government rather than a tax from you to the government. And your future Social Security benefits, we could say, hey, part of those benefits are not a transfer payment. They're really repayment of principal plus interest on this loan that I'm going to uh, say you're making to the government this year. So we're free to use whatever language we want. These things are not in concrete, but in present value, you see the true story, which is $211 trillion. So we're not broke in 20 years or 30 years. This is a credit card bill that we, it's due today. It's $211 trillion. It's not in the future that we're broke. We're broke today. So where does the 75 years come into play then? The 75 years is some accountant or some, you know, David Walker, who was a lovely guy, was the head of the uh, General Accountability Office for many years. Uh, he came up with uh, this calculation, the, uh, uh, the Social Security actuaries do a 75-year projection, but they also do an infant horizon projection. Why did that happen? Well, a very good economist named Ket Smenters was involved uh, under the, Bush, first, the second Bush administration in advising the actuaries, and he got them to put in this infant horizon calculation. That's the one that people should focus on. And if you look at that calculation in Table 4B6 of the Social Security uh, Trustees Report for 2012, you'll see that Social Security is 31% underfunded. The 75-year projection is about a third of this, the problem in terms of the calculation. So, again, these truncated calculations make no economic sense. It's, it's just like saying, gee, uh, the measurement of the distance uh, of this table that I'm sitting in front of today is a certain size, and that's the absolute truth. But Einstein taught us that the size of that ta- this table can be dramatically larger or, or smaller depending on our frame of reference, our language, our labeling in effect. And that's the same thing in economics. So you need to be focused on the infinite horizon present calculation. And it's in the table 4B6 for Social Security. It's not being done for the entire government sector except by people like me, an economist. The IMF actually did the calculation. They came up with a number that's uh, for the infinite horizon that's even bigger than $211 trillion. They did that uh, last summer. So there's the right way to do economics and the wrong way. And it starts with having actually an economist doing the calculations. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Another one of your works is entitled Jimmy Stewart is Dead, Ending the World's Ongoing Financial Plague with Limited Purpose Banking. Now, I assume you're referring to the Jimmy Stewart of It's a Wonderful Life. Tell us about that and and limited purpose banking. Okay, so this is a proposal for how to fix the financial sector, the financial system. And the financial system is a trust me banking system where the bankers say, trust me, give me your money, uh, I'll be safe with it, I'll pay it back. And uh, then they go off and gamble. And if they make a killing, they take the upside. If they lose money, they turn to the taxpayer to bail them out. So they don't let people see what it is they're investing in. So it's opacity and leverage. They're borrowing and then they're investing in things they're not telling you what they're doing with your money. So at the slightest sign that they're engaged in some kind of fraud or malfeasance, people want their money back out. So you can have runs very rapidly occur. And you saw this in It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart, this very honest banker, has a, experiences a bank run on, uh, and I think it's Christmas Eve or whatever, and 
he barely escapes insolvency for his bank. He, he tries to commit suicide. He finally gets rescued by an angel. He comes back and makes, makes a great speech and he saves his bank. But you see in that movie the fragility of the banking system. You see the dependence of all the trust on one person. And as soon as people start, start losing trust in Jimmy Stewart, that's it. Now, that's the situation we have here. We have all these people at the top of these banks who are the only ones who really know what their banks are doing. And in the case of J.P. Morgan, we see that Jimmy, Jamie Dimon doesn't even know what he's, his company is up to. And as soon as people lose trust, they start moving away from the banks. And that's where you have runs in the banks. So we have a very unstable financial system. And that's what we saw in 2008 when all these different financial companies uh, went broke, went down. We saw uh, a trust take a holiday. So limited purpose banking is a very simple reform. It's been endorsed by five Nobel laureates in economics, actually seven at this point, including two, two guys who got it for finance. It's been endorsed by George Schultz, the former Secretary of State and Treasury, Bill Bradley, Robert Reich, the former Secretary of Labor, just a long list of very prominent policymakers and economists to, in addition to the, to the Nobel laureates. And here's what it does. It says, look, let's take all the financial corporations and make them operate as mutual fund holding companies that issue 100% equity finance mutual funds. And let's do all the financial intermediation through 100% equity finance mutual funds. A mutual fund is like a little bank that takes in its money by selling shares and then it invests in the things that it's specialized in. So a mutual fund, because it's not leveraged, because it's not borrowing, cannot go bankrupt. So limited purpose banking changes all the banks into non-leveraged uh, mutual fund companies and they can never go broke again. And then the other aspect of limited purpose banking is that there's a single government agency called the Federal Financial Authority that discloses and verifies on the web in real time all the details of the securities that the mutual funds will be buying and selling and holding so that we have full disclosure. So the two problems that occurred in 2008 and are still plaguing us are opacity and, in other words, lack of disclosure, lack of transparency, and leverage. Limited purpose banking turns the lights on and it also eliminates the leverage of the banking system. And it moves us from show me bank, from trust me banking to show me banking. That's a great way to put it. The question is, could it ever happen? Because like everything in life, and, and this country is just degraded in so many ways with this problem, there's so many entrenched interests who have set up these iron triangles that want to keep things the way they are because they're all prospering from them. And, and with, with limited purpose banking, I mean, who, who would be the, the loser? I, I assume all the traditional bankers that are doing it the way... Really, well, traditional bankers. I, I don't want to say not traditional because tradition that's only a fairly modern tradition, but you know, the, I guess the traditional banker is the older banker. But who, who would lose in that system and who would block this type of reform? Well, the big banks wouldn't be happy with this, but we have to realize that limited purpose banking is, is already in large part in place in the U.S. We have a mutual fund industry, about 25% of our mutual funds, uh, excuse me, 25% of our financial assets and our financial intermediation is occurring through equity financed mutual funds. There is a small segment of mutual funds, well, not actually that small, that uh, are money market funds, but they're leveraged because they're making a promise to back uh, the, the uh, investments to the buck. And that's really like a, you know, a form of leverage. So that would not arise under limited purpose banking. So we have uh, a glass that's about 25% full already. You could move to limited purpose banking on a asset by asset basis. So you could start with, for example, mortgages. If you go to uh, a mutual fund system for the, uh, for mortgage uh, mortgages, you end up with what they've had in, in Denmark and Sweden and Germany for centuries, really, which is the covered bond mortgage system. So there's a bill in Congress uh, to uh, move our mortgage uh, market to uh, a covered bond system. This would be moving to limited purpose banking on that asset. So we could do this asset by asset and actually get there pretty quickly. Now, yeah, there will be opposition, very well healed opposition, but the public has a lot more votes than the bankers. So the real issue is getting the word out to the public. If enough people read the Jimmy Stewart is dead, 
go to the Purple Financial Plan, which is on my website. It's a, a website that I set up for uh, fixing the financial system. And then I've got other Purple Plans to fix other things like healthcare and social security. And Why is it energy. called the Purple Plan? Purple is to uh, say that this is something that both red Republicans and blue Democrats can agree to, and red plus blue makes purple. So, so we can get behind a reform that would actually work. The fact that so many prominent people have endorsed this, the fact that Mervyn King, who's the governor of the Bank of England, has publicly spoken about limited purpose banking and said it deserves serious consideration. The fact that uh, I've been asked to go talk to uh, uh, heads of central banks uh, in, in Sweden and Holland and in uh, Ireland. Last week, I was asked to speak about limited purpose banking to the Federal Reserve at, uh, Bank of New York. I spoke about it in China. So the word is getting out. There is a way to fix things and keep us safe. If we had limited pur- purpose banking in place in 2008, we would not have had a financial collapse of any kind. If they had limited purpose banking in place right now in Europe, we would not be seeing a sovereign debt problem. We wouldn't see Greece being forced to possibly... Uh, leave the euro, which again, I don't think is ultimately going to help it. We would not have the prospect of a massive run starting this week, this coming week in Greece, which could easily spread to Spain and Italy and all the other Portugal, uh, yeah. Portugal, Ireland, Ireland, and then to yeah. Belgium, France. Yeah. Yep. And it could come right across the ocean to the U.S. because the, the system as created is extremely fragile. We've got a system that's built to fail. That's what the Mervyn King, who's the governor of the Bank of England, he's been the the governor of the Bank of England for many years now. He's a very distinguished economist, a brilliant man. He described the design of the banking system as now exists as the worst possible design in a speech in 2010 in New York called the Buttonwood Conference. That's where he was speaking. And in that, in that speech, he said, we need to have radical reforms. There are three or four proposals. There's like four proposals for radical reforms. He went through three of them, and he rejected them in his speech. And then he came to limited purpose banking. He said, this uh, proposal deserves serious consideration. So all you have to do is look at his speech and you see where he's coming from on this. Now, he's Bernanke in the UK. So, And I, I like I like the – I'm looking at the website now. I like your much flatter tax system. I mean, it is – the federal tax system is totally broken. There is just no question about it. It's got to be simple, that, flat, transparent. Yeah, this is the purple tax proposal, which is really a very simple proposal for fixing taxes. I don't know if you have time, but I can tell you about that. Sure, I'd love to hear it. But, you know, I can instantly think the whole, like you said, people have more votes than bankers. But the problem is bankers have more lobbyists than people. And, and you know, I can see instantly with your first point on the principles of tax reform with the purple plan, you know, the CPA lobby is going to be lobbying against that. And it's just such a mess. <laughs> But go ahead well, and tell us about it if you want. Yeah, I think good ideas will, will out, will take over. Uh, I think they'll dr- drive out bad ideas and bad policy. I'm, I'm confident. Maybe I'm overly optimistic. But as uh, all this is described in more detail uh, in the, uh, the Clash of Generations, how to fix the economy and how to save ourselves personally, because the politicians may not fix things. But it's very simple uh, how to fix the tax system. You get rid of the uh, what you're doing now, which is a mess. You get rid of the federal income tax, the personal federal income tax. You get rid of the corporate income tax, which is really a tax on workers, not a tax on rich people, because the co- corporations can move to other countries where they pay less taxes. And and, and they and, certainly do that. They have no loyalty to U.S. Right. shores. And, right. and and you look at Apple did that with California, a more micro example of it, how they skirted a whole bunch of California tax by just simply setting up another division in Nevada. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. This happens all the time. It really just leaves the California workers behind. Boeing is moving out of Seattle for reasons, for competitive reasons, uh, or or Washington State, trying to move to California, I think South Carolina. And uh, there again, it's another example of corporations being able to move and leaving workers behind. So Get rid of the corporate tax, which will produce lots of investment in the country because we'll have the lowest corporate tax rate of any developed country, which is zero. Get rid of the personal income tax and then do the following. Uh, And also I get rid of the estate and gift tax, which is another employment act for lawyers. And all this may sound very regressive before I even said what I'm going to do to some of your blue listeners. But let people understand I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm an independent I think we need to have a highly progressive tax system that treats the fair, the poor much better than the rich. 
And here's how I would do that. I would take the payroll tax that we now have and make it highly progressive. It's the most regressive tax we now have. I would turn that around and make it highly progressive. I would take, I would start taxing consumption, uh, retail purchases at the store. I put on a federal retail sales tax and I would not only tax our purchases of consumption at the store, but also our consumption from sitting in our homes and enjoying our other durables. We're getting consumption services from those uh, durables, and they would be subject to the same tax rate, which would uh, effectively be 15%. So we'd have 15% payroll tax at the top. There would be no ceiling on the payroll tax. So the rich people would pay taxes on every single dollar they earn. The poor would only pay 7.5% up to 40000 I mean, people, workers would pay, uh, the tax would only be at 7.5% up to 40,000 and then 15% above that. So we make it highly progressive payroll tax. You have this consumption tax, plus it comes with a demigrant, a monthly payment to each household that's large enough so that poor people will get a monthly check that's big enough to cover their their payments of the uh, sales tax at the store so that they, uh, they will pay no sales tax on net. In other words, the consumption tax on balance for the poor will be zero. And I also maintain, by the way, the earned income tax credit. I run it through the payroll tax because that's one of our major uh, welfare programs. It's very important to have for tax progressivity to maintain the earned income tax credit. And then I have an, a progressive inheritance tax where the first million dollars of gifts or inheritance that you receive is tax free. And above that, you pay 15% on anything above that. So we have a 15 15 15 plan that's highly progressive. The top rate is 15, 15, 15, and nobody has to send in an annual tax return. So people that like the fair tax, because it's very simple and transparent, and you don't have to send in a tax return, should love the purple tax because it also has that feature, uh, those features that uh, you don't have to do annual tax filing. No, neither businesses nor individuals have to do that. Quite, quite a bit simpler for sure. Just kind of in wrapping up here, what do you see, what does our future look like? Hopefully some of these reforms will occur. That would be very helpful, but a realistic view of our future, you know, maybe out the next 10 years or so, 15 years, what can people expect? Well, the most realistic view is, is pretty, uh, pretty bad because we've spent decade after decade, really six decades running this massive Ponzi scheme. We have all these liabilities that are off the books by the careful choice of labels, Congress has kept most of the $211 trillion fiscal gap off the books. The official debt's about $11 trillion. So we've got $200, $200 trillion that Congress has, isn't publicly telling us about that we're, we've been ignoring. So unless we do radical surgery of the type that I'm outlining in the purple plans, and they do get the fiscal gap down to zero and even make it negative if we do all those things in the purple plans, including the health reform, uh, unless we do these things, things will just get worse and worse, and it will be uh, too late to really save the day. And we will end up with hyperinflation and a really uh, tough situation because I don't see either party coming up with the proposals needed to really address what's uh, what's necessary. Can you put a number on what you call hyperinflation? Well, for the for us, you know, a ten percent inflation would be a, a real shocker, but hyperinflation is. 50, 100% uh, price increases a year, and then it can go up from there. So I think for us, we're going to see if things continue this way, uh, we're not immune from standard economic law, which is that if you print more and more money and inject it in the economy, it gets out there, it will lead to price increases. The correlation over the centuries between the money supply and the price level, not you know on a monthly basis or daily basis or yearly basis, but over decades, there's a very strong correlation and it will continue. Uh, it will affect us. It could be that I'm wrong and that I'm overly pe- pessimistic and that the Chinese will start using the dollar instead of the yuan. But more likely... <laughs> more likely that, that would be funny. <laughs> more, yeah. More likely people will start using the yuan and other currencies that uh, are going to retain value and there'll be a movement away from the dollar. You know, the pound used to be the world's, world's currency, but that lost uh, value after World War II. It lost its role as the re- world reserve currency. So that will happen to the dollar as well unless, unless we change our ways. Give out your website and tell people where they can learn more if you would. Uh, so it's 
www.thepurpleplans.org. We'll give you all access to all the purple plans where you can go and read about the plans and endorse them if you like. Uh, the Clash of Generations is the new book with Scott Burns that tells you uh, about the magnitude of the problem and how to save your your own uh, yourself if you can't if we can't save the country. And uh, Jimmy Stewart is dead is this book about how to fix the financial system. It's not a how-to book. It's primarily a book about from an economist perspective about what really happened here, how to really understand the financial crisis. It's only at the end that I talk about limited purpose banking. So I think people will enjoy the, uh, even if they're not into the details of how to fix the financial system, which only are two short chapters long because it's a very simple fix, they'll enjoy, I think, the rest of the book. And I have to ask you one more question because you uh, mentioned it. What people can do on an individual level to yeah. uh, help solve their own problem, assuming the world's going to hell in a handbasket, as it, as it may well do, what can they do? I mean, one thing we can do is to, to get to make the most of our current situation in terms of getting the highest living standard safely. And I've developed through my company uh, uh, a software program. We have a, a basic version of it, which was rated number one by Money Magazine as the best financial planning program on the web. It's perfectly free. Uh, if you go to uh, esplanner.com, that's E-S-P-L-A-N-N-E-R.com slash basic, this uh, simple version of our software can be run by free just by clicking begin planning at the bottom. And you can find ways to safely raise your living standard, for example, using a Roth versus a IRA, which is better? Well, this program can help you figure that out. Should you take Social Security at this age versus a different age? Should you convert your uh, IRA to a Roth? Uh, should you take a job in Texas where the pay might be lower, but there's no state income tax and the housing costs are lower? These are the kind of things that you can de decide very quickly with our software. And uh, that's one answer. The other thing is that the book is full of suggestions, the Clash of Generations suggestions about how to improve your financial situ situation. And one thing is, uh, you know, not to get taken by brokers and not to spend a huge amount of money with these folks who uh, typically un underperform the market. Very good points. All right. Well, good. Larry Kotlikoff, thank you so much for joining us today. Interesting, scary, but it's better to be aware than sticking one's head in the sand because there are some defensive strategies and really some offensive strategies people can take in their own personal lives. So keep up the good work out there and, and keep promoting the Purple Plan. I would love to see reform in this area. It would just be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate your uh, having me on. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively. Hey, it's Jason Hartman, and the largest wealth transfer in American history is underway right now. And I want to invite you to learn how you can defend yourself against this wealth transfer, be one of the recipients of this wealth transfer instead of one of the victims of it because the chips on the table are changing. Everything is moving around. And this is the time to be more educated and more aware than ever. So join us for Empowered Investor Live. This event has a totally new name, Empowered Investor Live. It's in Orlando and it's in the middle of September, September 10th, 11th and 12th. Beautiful resort property in Orlando. You can make a vacation out of this. Bring the family, Disney, Universal, Epcot Center, just tons of great things to do in Orlando. So join us for this event in the middle of September, fantastic resort hotel. But look, that's not what it's about. It's about the education. It's about seeing the properties. It's about networking with fellow investors, learning how to create wealth in inflationary times and to explore the possibility of deflation in this market or 
a mix, right? Where some things are inflating, others are deflating, and you want to be on the right side of that trade. This wealth transfer is truly amazing. It has never happened before. There is not only the biggest wealth transfer in American history, but the biggest migration, at least in our lifetimes, if not longer. So discover the markets that make sense, the markets that are a ripoff. We will have local market specialists there. Our teams will fly out from all over the country like they, like they have at my past events. We've got great speakers lined up. We're gonna talk about estate planning, asset defense, asset protection, a whole new angle on asset protection, by the way, that we have never talked about before. It's just gonna be three great days. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, September 10th, 11th, and 12th, Orlando, Florida. Get your tickets now. Get the early bird price. Do not miss out on this event. By the way, if you're a member of the Empowered Investor Inner Circle, of course, you did get a discount. Be sure to look in the inner circle for that promo code, that secret discount code for you. And if you're not a member, you can join below and get this event included in that package price. So take advantage of it. We'll look forward to seeing you in beautiful Orlando, sunny Florida. And hey, I know a lot of you are thinking of moving here if you don't live here already. So it might be a good time to not only take a little vacation, but uh, attend the conference, learn a ton of things, and maybe explore some new areas, maybe some new places to live. So we'll look forward to seeing you in Orlando, middle of September. Get your tickets down below and we'll see you there.